Well, I'm just gonna start right into it. I got two really deep questions. You guys ready? You guys ready? Here we go. Have you ever had second thoughts? <laughs> yes. About the goodness of God. Have you ever had second thoughts about the goodness of God? And maybe you've had this second thought about the goodness of God because of some pervasive pain and suffering in the world and the news keeps putting it in front of us. And it's hard to see that a good God could really love the world when there's so much pain everywhere. Or maybe another way to ask this question is, have you had second thoughts about the goodness of God because of some personal suffering that's impacted your, your confidence in his goodness? If we just take about five seconds to consider that question, I think every single one of us in this room and watching online say, absolutely. We know this is true because life isn't always easy. Life isn't always a celebration. Not every moment in life deserves fireworks, amen? And the thing is, many of us have bought into a Christianity that sounds like, well, if God is good, then my life will always be good. And the reality is you won't find that God in Scripture. And so this morning, I'm inviting you into a space for us to reconcile with the gap between my life isn't what I thought it was going to be in Christ, because it's not always easy and suffering keeps happening, yet Scripture reveals to us this really good, awesome, amazing, merciful Father. And this morning, I'm inviting you into a space to really take a moment to say, hey, am I having second thoughts and why? And what does the Father have to say about that? Well, I'm going to take a, just a little bit of pen in that because I just, whew, I've never been in an auditorium where you're so quiet so fast. Well, the other day, a couple weeks ago, I went hunting. And some of you are all like, Jeremy, if you know me, you're like, he went hunting? Well, some of you guys call it the game of golf. I call it hunting for golf balls, but whatever. <laughs> and I love the game of golf. I'm terrible at it. I'm not good at all. I played tennis and baseball growing up, but you know, whatever. I love the game of golf. And, and my form of golf is going hunting for the shots that I hit. And quite frankly, usually the balls are unfindable, right? Like I'm a terrible hunter. If that's the name of the game, I'm also terrible at hunting. <laughs> but nonetheless, I, I, I go out and play. And I, one of my good friends, Brian, he and I go play a lot together. And a, a few weeks ago, we were playing. And um, at the end of the, or the first couple of holes, it was like neither of us had a clue how to play golf, which is probably true, but that's beside the point. We like to think we're the best when we're out there. But the first three holes were terrible. Now, just think about it for a second. When you start off with something and you're terrible, isn't it true our natural instinct is to quit? It's like, I really don't want to deal with this if I'm not good at it right away. Anybody else resonate with that? Yeah, right? Well, we get to the 18th hole, and my friend Brian, who had the worst first three holes I have ever seen in my life where I would have naturally want to quit. We get to the 18th hole. We look at his scorecard and we go, wow, that was the greatest round you have ever had. He ended up shooting an 82. Like, I think he had 82 in the first three holes. We might struggle with math, but whatever. And I, I don't know about you, but typically when I... I mean, doing anything like the game of golf, the first three holes, if I am that bad, I want to give up. And so I'm going to go back to those first two questions I asked. When you get to that second, that question of beginning to second guess whether God is actually good because life is throwing those first three holes at you and you, there's nothing you could do but to have a terrible golf game. In your case, it's just life seems to always throw things at you. I've learned something from my friend Brian. Actually, ironically, not only did he have his best round he ever had, I've had my best rounds I've ever had playing with Brian. And I went home thinking that day, okay, what's well, interesting? Why does Brian always play great with me? And more importantly, how is it I always play great with Brian? You know why? Because Brian's actually taught me something. He's a super competitive person that I am who doesn't like not being good at something. Okay, confession. I like being good at things and I don't like it when I'm not. How is it I can play terrible in the beginning of a golf round with Brian and actually love the game at the end of the 18 holes. And with everybody else, I don't. It's because Brian has a unique skill. 
the last shot that was terrible basically does not impact his belief in his next shot. If you think about people you respect and you love, like I think about the people that I, I admire, that I just adore. I think about the people where life has thrown so much at them and despite all of the grief and the pain and the suffering, years later, they still have this, this vigor and joy for life. It's kind of like Brian on a golf course. Those first three holes don't get him down somehow. And I want to ask, what do they drink? Because I need a drink of it. What does it take to be a Brian? What does it take to be the people I admire? Like for, uh, uh, for example, my grandparents, on my mom's side, if you, if you know them, like at the end of my grandfather's life at 86, like weeks before he was to pass away, we go into the, um, the nursing home he's at and everybody's calling him Sweet Henry. And I look at my mom, I go, his name's not Henry. Like, why do they call him Sweet Henry? And they're like, oh, he just joked one day that he was Sweet Henry and they all decided that actually you are like the sweetest man we've ever met. So we're gonna start calling you Sweet Henry. And I'm like, that is the epitome of my grandfather. But if you knew my grandfather's story, you sit there and go, how in the world could sweetness be what he was known for? At the age of 10, his father dies. At the age of 10, he went and got a full-time job in the 1930s. Why? Because that was the only way to supply for his family. Because the oldest brother happened to be handicapped and was incapable of going and doing work. And so at the age of 10, he goes and works and drops out of school in fifth grade because he had to. See, some of us, when we're faced with something like that, sweetness and joy at the end of our life is not the common theme. But unfortunately, there's so much more in this story. Flash forward some years, and then his own namesake, his son, at the age of 15, is diagnosed with leukemia and doesn't make it. At the age of 16, he passes away. See, if you knew my grandfather's story at 86, it doesn't make sense that he is a man known as the sweet, loving guy who is full of life despite all the sufferings. And I just shared two with you. There's so many more in the middle. And you know that's true because that's your life, isn't it? And yet there's just something special that I look at my grandfather and I go, Lord, what did he have I wanted? Because wow, I respect that in the first 30 holes, Brian didn't lose it. He believed he could still do it. Those are the people we admire. And we've been studying this guy named Joseph these last four to five weeks. And if you haven't listened to him, I really encourage you to go back and listen to the last few weeks of Pastor Nate and Pastor Mark who preached on the story of Joseph because Joseph is a perfect example of a guy whose first three holes were terrible. And if I were Joseph, I would not want to be positive. Actually, I don't think I'm going to be capable of being positive, let alone having any hope into the future. You see, some of us come into this space this morning, not just with second doubts that God is good. Those second doubts are not just reasonable, practical. Because like Joseph, something bad happens to you. You try to make the best of it. And no matter what you do, something else seems to happen. And it's not even your fault. Do you feel that? The weight of that for Joseph? Well, let me just show you a quick highlight of where we've gone the last few weeks with the Joseph story. A real quick recap. In Genesis 37 to 50, about fourth of the story of Genesis is the story of Joseph. And it starts in Genesis 37. In the very beginning, we find that Joseph is the young man who's the favorite one. He gets his fancy coat called the coat of many colors. Which, by the way, the coat of many colors was a common coat that people would have gotten. But it was always given to the firstborn who was the favored son. And instead, they give it to the 11th of 12 kids. So Joseph becomes naturally arrogant. If you read the story, I guess he becomes kind of an arrogant person. And then as a result, later on, unfortunately, totally unfair, his brothers hate him and are jealous of him. And they sell him off into slavery in the second half of Genesis 37. Sold off into slavery by his own family. He's betrayed by his own family. Nothing's fair. This doesn't make sense. But Joseph, I love Joseph. He makes the best of his story doesn't he? He works really hard and finds himself in Potiphar's house. Potiphar happens to be, a, to today's standards and comparisons, he essentially is a general of the Egypt army, a very high ruling official. As he gets into his house and that guy falls in love with Joseph, he makes the most of it and he gets to be the leader of that house until something is accused of him and Potiphar's own wife accuses him of doing something he never did. 
It's like Joseph, no matter how good he tries, how hard he tries, how much he wants to fix that slice, the ball always goes into the wrong fairway. And Joseph tries, and what happens? He gets thrown into prison. And in Genesis 39 to 40, we find that this Joseph guy, who always tries to pick it back up and do his best, he does. And he starts interpreting these weird dreams, and people start to realize there's something special and unique about this man. And then in chapter 41, the entire chapter focuses on Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Calls Joseph in to interpret his dream. Falls in love with Joseph. Again, Joseph makes the best of a terrible story. Man, I just love Joseph, don't you? Like, who? I want to be Joseph. Sort of. I don't really want all the pitfalls. I want all the good stuff. And then Joseph rises to power. The second half of Genesis 41 talks about how Joseph rose to power and became the the right-hand second in power in all of Egypt. He was essentially the vice president of Egypt. And if you had known Joseph's story, that seems like a ridiculous ending, doesn't it? In some ways, this is the story I think most of us in Christianity assume. Our assumption is that because we come to Christ, we are going to be made second and we're going to be powerful and we're going to be able to overcome everything. We wish the story of Joseph ended in Genesis 41, but it doesn't. Yet despite all these crazy circumstances, this is what I love about Joseph, Joseph continued to respond with faith that God was with him. His story is tragic. And I say this because it's going to resonate with many of us in the room, entirely unfair. Some of your deepest pain, not caused by you, but caused towards you. And it's really hard to reconcile because it's just so unfair. No matter what you do, it keeps coming back. But I have to admit that Joseph's story sits comfortable with me in a way because it helps me reason with my own pain and trauma. It helps me remember, oh, maybe there is a way out. Maybe I can still make the best of it. And I can see my hope, even in my despair. But Joseph, although he's the namesake of the story, is not actually the main character of this Genesis story. This is going to make some of us uncomfortable, but go with me for the next 25 minutes. The real main character of this story, who never leaves the story, and actually we skipped his entire chapter so far. We have yet to read Genesis 38. If you were wondering like, why we go from 37 to 39, this is why. Because the real main character of the story is the one who inflicted. This is going to be really uncomfortable. This is PG-13 morning, I have to say. Sex is coming up. Some inappropriate relationships are coming up in a little bit. So if you have children in the room and you're like, I just want to give you a heads up. The real main character of this story is actually Judah, who is the brother who throws Joseph into slavery. Joseph, the namesake, is actually not the main character. It focuses on the brother who suggested to all the brothers to throw this kid into slavery. He'll die there. Let me show you just real quick what I mean. Jo- Judas, throughout the entire story, I just showed you Joseph. Let me show you Judas. Judah sells Joseph into slavery, chapter 37. Chapter 38, the entire chapter is like random. In the middle of the saga of Joseph, break. Mm, let's go. I, we're going to do an entire break in the whole story. We're just going to focus on Judah for a little bit. You see Judah, and I summarize here. I encourage you to go back and read it. He marries a Canaanite woman, which he was not supposed to do. And he goes and continues to make a mess of his life. Now, I want to stop here and say, my natural reaction to this is that person deserved it. Anybody else? And this is a horrible response. I admit that. But in my own, in my own sinfulness, I want to go, well, the guy kind of did deserve it. It was kind of a jerk, right? And he continues on and he keeps making a mess of it. But then in chapter 38, man, this Judah guy never goes away. We find that Tamar, who happens to be his daughter-in-law, who can't have a child, her husband dies and he refuses to give her her dignity as he was called to do based upon the customs of the day. Man, what a, man, what a jerk. And then he continues, and I told you it was PG-13. Judah meets up with who he believes is a prostitute and I'll get to it in a little bit, just how crazy that story is going to get. This is the main story, by the way, friends. This is the main character. Then Judah convinces Jacob, the father of all 12 brothers, to send Benjamin, the youngest, to actually go with him to Egypt. And then, which we studied last week, and then this week, we see that Judah and his brothers, all of them, after all this drama unfolds, the last few verse, chapters 
begin to focus on the really uncomfortable storyline of the redemption of Joseph? No, it's Judah. And I want you to know right now, this is only part of Judah's story. I'm going to show you the rest of it in a minute. But you see, it. imagine just for a second, you're Joseph. All the reasons why you would have second thoughts about the goodness of God might come up. I just have to give a caveat right now that this is a really hard sermon to preach because I've been preparing for it the last two weeks. I found myself in tears, and I'm not saying that hyperbole, like legitimately. God was revealing some pain in my own life where I needed some healing, and I needed for the Lord to reconcile some things in my own heart for pain that I've given on to somebody else. And he also revealed two different scenarios where I thought I had moved on from something that happened seven years ago. And quite frankly, I'm still thinking about it. And praying, God, what do I do with something that happened seven years ago? So I just got to say that this message this morning is going to get heavy. It's going to get hard. Because we don't like the villain in any story, do we? So this, this reality that Joseph is not the main character, but Judah is, makes me ask this question. Why do we need this super graphic, sinful, uncomfortable, PG-13, if not rated R, story in the middle of the Joseph story? Why does Judah get so much attention? We hate a story that redeems the villains. Deep into our nature and our core as Christians, sadly, we as Christians who say from stage and believe and come to a church that says no one is too far from God, we ourselves still don't like it and struggle to believe in a reconciliation story for those who've hurt us the most. So this poses two problems. One, we hate the people who hate us or who hurt us. And our sinfulness and our best basic and that's who you are. I, I'm with you. I'm, I can only tell you this because this is me. This isn't shame for you. Like, if it's shame, I'm shaming myself first. Problem is, we really dislike the people who've hurt us, and we really don't pray for a redemption story for them, and we don't want to hear about it. And two, we ourselves have hurt other people and don't believe that we are worthy of the love and forgiveness that God actually offers to us. But here's the question that the Holy Spirit kept drawing me to when I considered those two problems. He kept drawing me back to this own question, and I'll get to this story in a minute, but seven years ago, something that happened to Sarah and I is the the epitome of our great church hurt that we took a long time to overcome, and I discovered in the sermon prep, I still have some work to do, and trusting that the Holy Spirit wants to heal. Is this how... This is, the, this is the literal question I felt like the Holy Spirit asked me. Jeremy, how would your outlook on life change if you believed? I mean, italicized, really believed that God was with you in every situation. I hate this question. This is hard for me to hear. How would your life be different if you believed in your career, in your marriage, in your, through your divorce, relationship with your kids, How about this, relationship with your parents who have hurt you in the past? You name the scenario. How would it be different if you believed that God was with you in every single situation? Here's another way to phrase the question. How would your life be different if you believed God was with you in your times of suffering, not just your times of joy? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just, I want to pause and invite, I believe your Holy Spirit's with us, but I just want to pause because I believe in my own spirit as I think about this. When I have to admit that I don't like the fact that you've challenged me to preach on it on something that I need to hear myself. So Lord, I just pray that you'll give even me grace as the presenter, but give us grace as the hearers to hear what your spirit has to say about a topic we don't want to talk about. One that uproots all of the emotions and all of the feels and all the pains. God, I just pray that this morning, this sanctuary, this auditorium, it would be a, a safe space for us to meet the Holy Spirit, who truly is good, who is gracious, who is kind, and offers us new mercies for today. Holy Spirit, come and, and give us the grace we need. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So what if you actually believed that God was with you and loved you? Let me give you a list of things that I thought of, and it won't be exhaustive because you have more for your own life, but let me give you a few. That I, and I want to mention one specifically in a minute because I think it's one that we don't mention often in the church. But specifically, I'll start with the first one, and this is going to be hard. I, I'm saying things are going to trigger you. I told you it was rated RPG-13. What if you actually believe that God was with you when you're going through the divorce?
What if you believe God was with you when he passed, when you were passed over again for a promotion that you've been working so hard for that you feel like you've deserved? And you feel like you're, you just, your boss doesn't like you and they hate you or they keep mistreating you and he seems like it's unfair. Like how do you, what would it be like if you actually believed God loved you? Uh, this is the one I really wanted to make sure I say because I think this is missed often a lot. What happens, what it would actually, what would it look like for you, your outlook on life, if you believe that God was with you, if you're the person who was born with a disability that God does not seem to want to heal you of? I don't think we talk about that one enough. But there are some of us who really struggle with that. It's unfair. I didn't cause this, but it's been caused to me. It's a different form of a similar story of Joseph. And then we know these. These are, these are the, honestly the easy ones to it's the wrong word. It's not easy to talk about, but we know they exist. And that's the injustice done to us. A prejudice was done against you. And it's really easy to tell your friends how much pain you have and how much you dislike the other person. How, what would it be? How would your life, outlook on life actually change if you believe God was with you in every suffering and every trauma that you've experienced? Just like Joseph and his brothers, this is the tension we have to live with. Everyone is broken. Here's the problem. Everyone. I told you this was hard for me to preach because I'm preaching to Jeremy today. I'm broken. I am so in need of grace. And what I see in this story of Judah and Joseph, and I'm going to explain it to Judah's story in just a second, is that there are two primary groups of people that we see. I really think there's a third one that we need to see. The first one is that those who have been hurt by others. Joseph is the person in the story who's been hurt by others, right? We, we can sympathize with him. We hurt for him. We, sometimes we can revere him because he fights and, and, and always makes something good of his story, right? Like it's really cool, but we also feel quite bad for the guy. But then there's a second person in here, and this is the one we don't like, and it's the Judah. The one who's caused the infliction against you, the one who's hurt you, the one where I even say this, and, and I, I, I literally, I, I'm not trying to dramatize this, but my chest is pounding because I, I know the name and the face of the person I'm thinking of for me. And it hurts to even bring it up because that person is the person that's starved for me to when I say that Jesus could love that person when they've hurt me so much. But I, what I've learned is, is there's actually a third category, and I would say it's me, and I actually think it's you, it's those who've been hurt by people who've also hurt other people. We've all are broken. According to Romans chapter three, everyone in this room watching online desperately needs a savior. My invitation for you this morning, while you second guess, is to acknowledge that we are broken. You are broken. I am broken and I need a savior this morning. And what's crazy about the Joseph story is that Joseph was broken, hurt, and alone. And the, different, the distance of time between Genesis 37, where he sold under slavery, and then Genesis 44 that we pick up today is 25 years. You know what that means for Joseph? 25 years of feeling alone. 25 years of assuming your family members are never coming back to see you. 25 years of no one ever coming to try to find you because you've been lost. 25 years of trying to get up the corporate ladder and being struck. 25 years of trying to fix your marriage and everything you do, it seems to never work. 25 years of it. Do you feel the weight? And for some of us, we walk into this room in 25 years. It just happened last night, Jeremy. And yet Joseph does something that's credible. It's incredible to me that without, for 25 years, without a resolution, without a redemption story that includes the other people, he never gets reconciliation with the person who hurt him. Throughout his entire storyline, it always says that God was with him and people could see God in him. Actually, I didn't quote it for you, but... Potiphar actually invites him to be the leader of his house because he actually says, I can see God in him, is the quote. I love the Joseph story because it helps me, but the reality is it's the Judah that I am. And what it shows in me is that about, it's this entire crazy story is about God working behind the scenes to this very messed up, broken situation to build up a nation that he has promised. But then I look at chapter 37, 38 again, and I see this Judah guy that I don't like, and I ask this question, but how could it be Judah? That's the main story. How could a good, gracious God, this is someone we've got to reconcile with, how is a good, gracious God is the one that would choose Judah, Judah to be for all the people, 
be the one that carries the blessings for all of Israel. As people who've been hurt by others, as somebody who's been hurt by somebody like Judah, we need to face this story head on and find a way to reconcile with the fact that God chose Judah to be his namesake. All the people who've been hurt by others, who have hurt others and struggle to believe themselves that they are worthy to be loved again, we need to face this story head on and reconcile with the fact that God loves us unconditionally and wants to transform your heart too. Simply this, this is what I want to show you this morning, is that Judah's evil and self-centered heart that has hurt you. This is so hard. You, maybe you're that person, you're Judah who hurt somebody else. That Judah's evil and self-centered heart is transformed over these 25 years by God's grace to be the person who God uses to actually save his people. Let me show you how. Let me show you how this morning for this the next few minutes. I know this is heavy, but the very first thing I want you to see is that Judah, this is gonna be hard for some of us, Judah accepts he is guilty as charged. See, in Genesis 37, he does it. He goes home to his dad and he says, no, 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 no. Like, something happened, something crazy happened. He got eaten by wild animals. He comes up with some crazy story and doesn't take responsibility for his actions and his own jealousy and his own pride. And then in Genesis 38, here's the PG-13 part. We find in Genesis 13, or 38, verse 15, it says, when Judas saw her, this woman, he thought she was a prostitute for she had a cover over her face. Not realizing though that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her, by the roadside and said, come now, let me sleep with you. Jump a couple of verses ahead in verse 24. It says this, about three months after that moment, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution. And as a result, she is now pregnant. So what does Judah, how does Judah respond? Bring her out here and have her burned to death which was a customary thing. It's a weird thing to listen for our cultists today, but it was a customary thing. And as she was brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law, I am pregnant by a man who owns these. Now, here's a crazy thing. This is really weird, but it, it was also culturally norm for you, if you were to meet up with a prostitute, that you actually had to give them something of yours to identify who you are. And so Judah does exactly that. He actually gives her his shawl, which would have actually been the namesake of the entire family of Abraham. And he gives this shawl to her to say, hey, this is who I am, which is like a crazy concept. But all this to come back to say this, because she says, see if you recognize whose seal and cords and staff these are. So Judah, now out in the public court, is faced with this. And how does Judah respond? See, in Genesis 37, we know how he responds. He runs from responsibility. He denies it and makes more mess of it throughout most of chapter 38. But now at the end of chapter 38, I know this is hard, to hear, but can I just show you the God of grace? Here's the Judas story. He responds, he says, she is more righteous than I. Since I, wouldn't, or since I wouldn't give her to my son, Sheila, and give her her dignity, she was to desert. And then it says, he did not sleep with her again. She is more righteous than I. The only way Judah could say this phrase, she's more righteous than I, is to acknowledge for the first time and admit the unrighteousness of his own heart. This is pivotal, a pivotal change, a critical turning point in the Judah story. He notices the righteousness in Tamar, and as a result, he accepts the unrighteousness in himself. This admission by Judah may seem insignificant to you. Because think about it. Couldn't this admission also just be shallow words? Like as a parent, you know, your kid goes and does something and they mistreat one of their siblings. And what you ask them to do? Like the common thing is to say, hey, go apologize to your brother right? That's a common thing to say. And then your kid goes and apologizes. And let's be honest, how often are those words sincere by the kid? <laughs> so I read this story of Judah and in my, in my dislike for the villain of every story, I go, oh, well, maybe Judah's kidding. Maybe he's just fluffing it up and, and bluffing. And he doesn't want us to actually know that he, he's against it. No, no, no. This isn't bluffing. This is a crazy transformation story. We're just a chapter before he wouldn't accept responsibility. And for most of this chapter, he wouldn't accept responsibility. And now here he does. So don't miss the relevance of Judas' actions post tomorrow's revelation that I think Christ has for you this morning. The healing we all desperately want. And what? The healing we desperately want through the divorce that we went through. 
the fact that we've been passed over the promotions, the disabilities we were born with, the pains that other people have inflicted on us, you name it. The healings that you wish you could have. The healing in all those things doesn't start by you looking at the other person and blaming them, although that's fair and understandable. And they do deserve the blame. The healing for you starts with you actually looking inside of you and acknowledging and accepting you too need healing. It's about accepting that something happened and that you need to go to God with it. Going to God with your pain, but rather than focusing on the unrighteousness of the other person, which seems fair, it's not a healthy thing to actually do. You focus on the unrighteousness of your own heart. Judah could have easily blamed Tamar for tricking him. He could have, and she would have been stoned to death. And his story would have gotten worse and worse and worse. But something changed in Judah, and he didn't. He praised her for her righteousness and accepted his own unrighteousness. And when you are willing to accept your own unrighteousness, the second thing happens. Judah went from self-centered in Genesis 37 and most of Genesis 38 to actually now as we jump forward the 25 years to Genesis 44, we're going to see that he went from selfish and self-centered to self-sacrificing for the other favored brother. In Genesis 44, verse 14, it says this, what can we say to my Lord? Judah replied. They've caught to have actually stolen something of Joseph's and of the Pharaoh's. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? Judah says, God has, un- God has uncovered your servant's guilt. Do you see the transformation in Judah? This is weird. We are now my Lord's slaves. We ourselves are the ones who's found to have the cup. And it turns out that Benjamin, the other favorite brother, is the one who's found to have the cup. And the drama unfolds in verse 33. It says, now then, Judah says, please let your servant, he's talking about himself, remain here as my Lord's slave and be placement of the boy. See, in Genesis 37, he got jealous, and what does he do? He throws him out. And then Judah, the villain of the story, actually now becomes the person who's transformed. And he says, please let me go in replacement. Let the boy return to his brothers. And he continues, and he gets to the drama of the story, and he says, I, how can I go back to my father a second time without this boy with me? No, you can see the desperation of Judah. There's a passionate energy and change in this man. Don't let me see the misery that would come on my father's face. Judah's path started with acceptance of guilt. And as a result of being willing to look inside and say, God, help me heal from me. And not just only I'm not, no, I'm not dismissing all the pain you have. I'm inviting you to see the healing that you have for you while you travel through an incredible amount of pain. And Judah's path from self-centeredness to self-righteousness, to self-sacrificing rather, becomes a family man who demonstrates the true transformation. You guys ready for this? I think Judah becomes the hero of the story because he is a representation of Christ that demonstrates that true transformation is possible no matter how far you are from God. And if you're sitting here today like me who's been reminded of your deep pain, it's hard to hear. So the third thing I want you to see is that we actually have hope. Judas proves to us we have hope. Here's the problem. I want to repeat it. You are broken, you're hurt, and you need healing. Pastor Jeremy is broke, he's hurt, and I need healing. I have a problem. How do I have hope in my most despaired moments in my life? How do you? The solution, God forgives and accepts. But I want you to see this last part. God never stops with you until he heals all of you. See, the thing is, God doesn't want you to just overcome. Now, this is going to be crazy. He doesn't want you just to overcome and learn how to live and to, over, and, and to prosper despite all the pain you've had. Like, that's kind of the prayer we usually have. Lord, help me just overcome this, right? And that's a, that's a good prayer, but I don't think that's actually the blessing that Jesus came to die for. I think he came so that you could actually be whole in him and have true life, that you have freedom and healing despite the circumstances of your life. As I was writing, I, I, I had this prayer, and I want to read to you this, a sentence of it that I wrote, because quite frankly, I need this healing. And it's, I wrote this, it's, out of the ashes of my suffering can rise the phoenix of redemption. The 
ashes of your sufferings can rise the phoenix of redemption where your pain becomes the fertile ground for transformation in you. The moment Judah admits and turns from his old ways, we call that repentance in the church. The moment he does it and he offers sacrifice for Benjamin is the moment that Joseph reveals himself and reconciliation for this family became possible. But it started with Joseph, us looking in ourselves and begging for healing for me. Lord, transform me. And if you believe, if you would really believe, back to our original question, that God was with you in every circumstance. If, that, if you really, really want to believe that, I have three things I want you to, to encourage you. If you're a note taker, write this down. It'll be on the screen, but I want you to write these down. I prayerfully consider these three things. Here's first is the myth. So you hear a story like this, it's people who don't like the villain of the story and we don't like villains who are redeemed. Here's the first myth. We are conditioned to think that our circumstances prove God's love. But that's not true for Joseph or Judah, is it? There's enough in this story that Joseph should not have been known as a person they could see God in. See, some of us have bought into this, what I would like to, I don't, I don't want to bash other communicators, but like, I just see sermon after sermon after sermon where we promise your life is going to get so much better. It actually might get harder, but God is with you in it. So we've preached the message that it just gets so much easier when Jesus enters. It does in some regards, but it doesn't prevent all pain and suffering. We are conditioned to think that our circumstances prove God's love, but the problem with that is not everything in life is good. Life is hard. Bad things happen to good people. Crazy fact, Christians do bad things when they love Jesus. You're staring at one who hurt his wife. I told you PG-13, I'll admit it. We were married for one year. My wife, I walked in from work one night and she was crying. I said, what's up? And she had found that I was still struggling with pornography and I thought my marriage would fix it and it didn't. By the grace of God, 14 years later, here we are and we've healed together. And we learned that this story is true. When I hurt her, and I will never forget the facial expression and the emotions my, had, my wife had when I walked into that room and I realized the amount of pain I inflicted on her. I'll never forget that. And some of us in this room have second thoughts about how good God is because we've been conditioned to believe that our circumstances will prove that He's good. Problem is, even good people do bad things. How do we reconcile with God when he's called good, gracious, and loving when his people often aren't? I think it's because your conditions don't necessarily prove God. He's just in them with you. Here's the second thing I want you to see. How, this was a big one for me, and I think we see this actually in Judah's story and Joseph. How you respond to the suffering in your life, I think reveals to you the healing you need with Jesus this morning. So I told you this was hard for me to preach because seven years ago, Sarah and I started this journey of church planting in downtown Indianapolis. And I, I remember it was a, we just we took a long time to accept that God was wanting us to do this and to sell our house and to move into downtown Indianapolis, something we quite frankly did not want to do. And I remember how hard it was. And I, 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 we went in and we, we told the pastoral staff and we told the board and we resigned and we had three months of a transition period. And then I remember one of the last staff meetings I sat in or the pastor that I had looked up to, who had trained me, who had supported me, who had mentored me, said one of the most harmful, hurtful things I could have ever heard. And quite frankly, I have to admit to you, I thought I was over it because time's passed. But time doesn't heal all wounds. Because as I was preaching, or prepared to preach this, I went, oh, how do I respond to adversity? Actually, my chest started pounding and that person's face and name came up and I remember the room I was sitting in. I could tell you what the room looked like. I could tell you where I was sitting at the tables. I could tell you why the tables were designed because that pain is so real. For some of us in this room, it's hard to reconcile with God when that pain is still so real. And so as your pastor who got the wonderful privilege to preach this in front of you and tells you, gosh, I need Jesus this morning, how you respond to that adversity reveals to you, because I've learned it was revealing to me the, the healing that I have needed. I know this is true because the story of Joseph and Judah is a, is a powerful story, a testament to faith, forgiveness, and belief that even in the face of the worst adversity in the world, God is working. Let me show you, I've gone over a few minutes, so I'm sorry, but let me show you the full story of Judah. So you'll see some similarities. 37 and 38 still look like an awful Judah. 43, still kind of a weird Judah who 
does his dad and his brothers really trust him again? Because he's been this awful guy over and over and over. Don't forget, they know the Judah of Canaanite too, right? But then 44 comes and something, he has this passionate plea. And then rather this selfish person, he becomes a person of sacrifice. And it's crazy. And then he returns to Jacob. I don't want to steal next week's sermon because that's next week's sermon. But I want to show you Matthew chapter one. Joseph is not mentioned in Matthew chapter one as the person who the hero of the story who gets the lineage of Jesus Christ. Do you know who is? The villain. And as Christians, it's hard to hear this, but as Christians, we need to hear this, that Jesus Christ is a God who is a redeemer of all people. No one is too far from God to experience life change through Jesus. It's Judah who actually gets the namesake for the kingdom of Israel. If you have read the Old Testament, the, northern, the, the kingdom gets split in half over a civil war, essentially. And, and the, the northern kingdom becomes named as Israel, and the lower kingdom, which Jerusalem, gets known as Judah. Do you know how many good kings came out of Israel? Zero. All the good kings in the Old Testament came out of Judah. Not only did they come out of Judah, they were literally Judah's descendants. Not his brothers, not Joseph's descendants, Judah's. See, in our brokenness, that's unfair. But that is the God we believe in, and that can be your story. See, I know we don't like hearing the villain story because to be honest, it's like we're all pro-Joseph in this story and we're anti-Judah and it makes sense. But can I just invite you to something? This is going to be really hard for a few of us. I think all of us are Judah. That was hard for me to admit this week. You see, while Judah spends much of the story as the villain, God transformed even the villain by his love for him to be the man who accepts his guilt. Some of us need to start there this morning. And out of that, he seeks reconciliations with those who he's hurt and offers hope to the world and becomes the namesake of Jesus Christ. I know for some of us in this room, this is a hard thing to hear. It's a really hard thing to hear. It's a hard thing to accept. Um, I guess I still need this. Um, I'm, I'm gonna do something a little bit different this morning. I actually wrote a prayer that I've been praying over the last week and a half because I need this prayer, I've needed this prayer, and I'm still as a person who's praying this prayer. But I wanna pray it over you, and I wanna invite you. You don't have to say it out loud, but you can just repeat it after me and allow the Holy Spirit to come. Because quite frankly, we hate the villain, but yet we believe in the God who redeems him. And I wanna invite you to be a person who's healed this morning, or at least begins the journey of healing. Whether you're the one, the one who hurt someone else or you've been hurt or quite frankly, the combination of the two. Here's, just bow your heads, close your eyes, receive this prayer. Holy Spirit, I pray that this prayer would be transformative and real. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving and accepting us despite our brokenness. Thank you for loving us when the pain suffering and unfairness of this broken world clouds our memories of just how good you are. Forgive us, Father, for not recognizing the buffet of blessings that we actually get to enjoy every day while we suffer because you love us so much. Lord, this morning, help us to grow in accepting our own guilt along the way. Help us to see our own idols and to transform us from our own self-protecting, selfish people into a self-sacrificing people who love others. And Lord, this last sentence just struck me this week, and I pray it would be a blessing for other people this morning. Refine our taste for all the things you. Jesus, heal some people in this room. Just bring a restorative heart. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for being a God. He truly loves us this much. In your name we pray, amen.